I want to present uh, work we've been uh, attacking for five, six years now, really. Um, yeah, so I want to, I want to show you this, this, uh, this instrument that we've created for measuring happiness. It's, you know, it's, a, it's a rough thing. I'll show you how we've made it better. Uh, and it has a long way to go. But I'll show you what we've been able to get to. So, a couple, so we'll, we'll have, I really want to talk about the instrument itself. Uh, and, and then some of its outcomes. There's something about the positivity of the English language which I think is quite profound and I'll have that in there as well. And I'll give you a little bit about geography and health. And there's a ton of other things we've done that it just can't fit in. Um, I could try and I've tried to do that and I usually fail miserably. But only making it halfway through the, through the lecture. So I'll see if I can get all the way through. So um, <clears throat> this is, uh, so it was Valentine's Day yesterday and I actually just gave this talk at MIT at the media lab yesterday, some version of this. So I, 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 I threw this at the start. So I'm going to keep it here for one more day. Um, so this is uh, from Twitter. So this is looking across cities. This is work by Lewis Mitchell uh, across the US. So you look at census regions. Um, and we have our measure of happiness, which I'll explain. And then this is the percentage of people who are, who are married. So it's, it's scattered, but uh, it's, it's going up. It's a very strong peak value here, you can see. So, so that's, that's good. That's not such a bad thing. Uh, I had to give my talk yesterday at 8.30 a.m., so I've changed this a little bit, but we're about here in the day. So this is an averaging over many, many days, looking at people's tweets again. Uh, this is the happiness level. So you can see it starts off, it's a little more closed in in the morning, too, emotionally. Right? So people wake up, they have some coffee, they say good morning to each other. And then there's this descent <laughs> through the day, we call this the daily unraveling of the human mind, and then you have to get rebooted. So anyone who's up tweeting, so this is sort of biological midnight, right? That's when your, your temperature's the lowest, and it's fine if you're up here. If you make it to here, then you're really, you're about to go to bed. And this is the earliest time people are starting to get up. So as some sort of a side confirmation, we have swearing, right? So these are five different words you can't say on TV, or maybe you can say some of them now, I suppose. But um, and they're very, very different frequencies of usage, and they, they've been normalized to show you how they fit through a day. And so it's a couple of cycles. And you see, right, very remarkable, and they're very different words. They're very, very different words, which, uh, which are embedded in the figure name, but I'm not going to say with that. Um, they, uh, you, see, you see this uh, nice climb through the day as, as uh, things go, go wrong. So we're, we're, that's not too bad. So never have a meeting at the end of the day um, is one of the upshots of this, um, which you may have, you know, adds to that story. All right, so here's the team. This is Chris. Uh, it's really Chris and his hair, but this is sort of my, my colleague at the moment. So they can go up and down. Um, and we have, one, we have one postdoc at the moment. We'd love to add a whole bunch. We're, we're getting there. We've got some nice money coming in. And then a whole a slew of graduate students. Some people have moved on to other places. So it's developing a, a nice story. So it's a computational story lab that's kind of framing for us. We eventually want to get to extracting stories from all sorts of uh, uh, text and so on and frames and metaphors. That's a, a big long-term thing. Uh, that's Dan Got to give him a shout out there. <laughs> I like to do this. This is uh, the person I work with. OK, so. Um, <laughs> You know, you guys will know all this sort of thing, but I, I, this, this, I, I remember seeing this, uh, this interview as it occurred and thinking, wow, I really wouldn't want to be an economist, which I already thought was true, but this just added to it. So this is Greenspan, this is 2007, some things have happened since that time that you may uh, be aware of. And so let's just see what he said then. So this is, I've been dealing with these big mathematical models of forecasting economy. I can't, I really can't help but put this slide into almost every talk. Just a bash in my um, uh, And I usually find a way to put it in there. So if I can figure out how to determine whether or not people are more fearful or changing to more euphoric, so this is emotion, right? Um, it's a strong statement, and, and you don't have to believe exactly what you're saying. Because, right, but I don't need any of this other stuff, right? Throw away the mathematical models. Um, I can forecast the, the economy better than any way I know how. So this is you know, one motivation here. Uh, uh, and I'll get to other stories about happiness. But the trouble is that we can't figure out how to do that. He's been here for 50 years. He's no better than he ever was, which, again, <laughs> sort of running his mouth a little bit. Nobody else is. Um, it's still no good. And the, and the reason is that human nature hasn't changed. Uh, we can't improve ourselves. So a little, descend it a little bit towards the end of that. This is actually an interview with John Stewart. If you can find it, it's still there. I mean, all, if, if you get on my slides, all of these things are clickable, and you can link to them. Uh, it's a great interview. The whole thing is a great interview. That's really, really lots of good stuff in there. Of course, that's uh, Stuart's a highly um, you know, complicated reply. Anyway, so, um, all right, measuring. Measuring is good. We have terrible trouble understanding what science is sometimes, but you know, describing and explaining is the thing I can boil it down to in the simplest way. 
um, you know, I come from a physics math background. This is the sort of bread and butter of real science, uh, you know, science everywhere. This is Lord Kelvin, so one of the more famous physicists from uh, the 19th century. To measure is to know. It's a strong statement. Uh, so I'm trying to get, I'm going to defend this building of a of a measuring instrument. Uh, if you can't measure, you can't improve it. And I think that that's a very salient feature, right? and you guys know all about this. Uh, engineers can certainly make things better, but if they're only putting so many things into their optimization function, then you know, it's not going to be good for people. What it is. All right. Um, you know, so he said some things that weren't right. So he said X-rays were going to be a hoax. Ho he said there's nothing more to do in physics. Would have been a little surprised by quantum and chaos and all sorts of stuff. All right. Fuck. Just a, you know, cherry picking the comments. So happiness. So we have a, a long history of saying this is what we want. And uh, so we have uh, important people who have lots of time in their hands and wealth and so on saying that they want some <laughs> happiness. So that has to be taken in that light. Uh, so the ancient Greeks talked about eudaimonia. I mean, all these stories are much more complicated. To some of this, some of them, this was interpreted as wine and, and food. But this is the notion of, of, of flourishing, right? This is a good spirit, I suppose. Uh, then we have Bentham turning up saying, you know, the, the right way to uh, behave is the way that maximizes happiness for, for the most people. Uh, talking about utils and heat, it's a, it's a funny story, right? How do you measure these things? Uh, in the 1800s, we have Edgeworth. Edgeworth coming up with this idea of what will happen, the hedonometer, saying, well, if we could measure people's happiness, then we could do something about it. And so Jefferson, so then we have the pursuit of happiness, and that's, you know, that's brought out all the time. That's a, that's a strong statement. So here's a, here's a obviously not true, um, version of the early draft. It's life, liberty, it was actually property, from what I understand. It was life, liberty, and the pursuit. Of, I don't know if it was the pursuit, pursuit of property, but property was the last bit, which is a bit doesn't have the kick. So, so some editing went on, and um, we got to happiness. And uh, you know, that's a, now we take it as if that was always the story. Right. Um, now, it's not just for these people who have lots of money and, and uh, you know life ahead of them. Uh, average people report this, and so there's a lot of uh, references for this. Uh, and there's some evidence that happy people live longer. Okay. Yeah. Now, after all, in marijuana, that's not so great, right? So things can go horribly wrong. What we're trying to uh, to get to here is an another instrument, another uh, dial to put on the dashboard of society, if you like, right? GDP is there, fine. And we want to add some uh, you know, other pieces as well. So it's emotion. How do you measure emotion? Uh, well, you'll be aware of this. The UK has, uh, there, there are other, other places, but certainly indices of well-being are being created and measured, often by self-report. I think the UK, they interview maybe, I can't be turning, it's, a, it's, it's many thousands of people uh, you know, every couple of months to come up with a new number, calling people on the phone, how happy are you? <laughs> Not very happy you called me. <laughs> Government <laughs> asked me out, like, what have I done? You know, is my mother listening? All right, so self-report's complicated. So, Yes, I'll put this out there if you, if, you know, maybe you guys don't think this, but we're, we're, you know, we're watching what people say, in particular with Twitter, so it has an Orwellian flavor to it, and if you go the wrong way, then you end up with uh, giving so much to everyone and, uh, because you're trying to maximize happiness. So that's not necessarily what we're saying at all. We're trying to measure emotion. What you then do with that is another story, right? We might want everyone to be grumpy. Um, <laughs> Which just may find that's the best situation. But it's coupled with many other somewhat incommensurate pieces. So, this is what we want to build, uh, what we'll call a hedonometer. And the term, as I said, goes back to Edgeworth in the 1880s, just sort of an idea piece saying, well, it'd be nice to measure everyone's happiness. We want to do it in a remote sensing way, right? This is the transition that many sciences uh, eventually get to. Uh, we want it to be transparent, and so that turns out to be a hard thing. Uh, for, for many, uh, there, are, there are other competing approaches, and uh, many of them are natural language. Processing methods. We want it to be fast because we're dealing with so much data now. We want it to be based on written expression because that's where we're hearing from people in an enormous way, right? Texts and tweets and so on. Um, we'd like to have human evaluation in there. We have to have that in the loop somewhere. That's fair enough. That's just a normal thing. Non reactive means we're not asking you uh, how happy you are. Uh, but on the, of course, we're not trying to replace. Uh, well, some people would want to do this, but we, we don't want to completely just replace self-reported measures. It's a compliment to that, right? So people have different responses when they're asked, asked questions. So as to when you're watching. All right, so we want it to be improvable, and I'll show you how we've improved it in interesting ways. All right, so we started with this so-called any new study. It's effective norms for English words. It's still not clear as why they did this. I don't, do we know? I don't think we do know. And, uh, it's just a study that was sitting on the web, and we found it, and there's a thousand words, 
that have scores, average scores for each word in terms of how positive people feel when they read them. Right? So this is a, the instrument we're creating is how you feel when you see someone else talking. So it's inherently kind of a social thing. So simply, you were given words. Uh, there was pancakes, church. There's a funny collection of words in there, actually. Uh, there were some very negative ones, some very positive ones. But again, about a thousand words put together by uh, psychologists, and it was just okay. These are these are words that have emotional meaning. Plus, pancakes, ski jump is in there as well. Um, so it's a bit of an odd, odd set of words. And, and uh, one of the things that's missing with many of these corpora is their frequency distribution. And to how often those words are used. That's just absent from this story. All right. So you're simply given this. It was done with 50 gra uh, under undergrads at uh, University of Florida. Typical, you know, here was a beautiful study, but it's students. Um, <laughs> and uh, they, there are a couple of other dimensions. So this is an old uh, finding in psychology, and, and there are various uh, improvements and changes. But basically, excitement and how powerful you feel in response to something. If you put these three pieces together, that, that gets a fair amount of emotional space. So the, the setup for, for this was semantic differentials, so smooth to rough, you know, where you put this thing that you're evaluating on all of these one-dimensional semantic differentials. And so people given a, a, large, a much larger list of emotional space. The, the, the finding was, and this goes back to even the 50s, I think, that these three categories covered most of so it turns out this is a much uh, stronger signal, and it is somewhat coupled to these. It's a much stronger signal from what we saw back then, and uh, and the way it was framed was sort of included everything. So at this end, you're feeling happy, excited, positive, right? This really was sort of a catch-all. So in some sense, you can think about positivity as being an overall signal. So how do we do it? Very simple. Um, this is okay. Michael Jackson, I'm a fan. So. Uh, uh, we take a text, and of course this is a tiny text, this is a tiny text, we would never do it at this scale, we would never do it for a tweet, for a sentence, it's just too small. Uh, and especially uh, one that's not spoken orally, it's very hard for even a person to judge what's in a, in, in a sentence. So you can, there are many examples, um, where you can, you, depending on the, the emphasis you put on words, you can change the meaning completely, fine. Uh, so we do a very simple thing, we throw away context, so in this case, this is going back to this uh, ANU study, we had these words. So we have beauty, queen, movie, mother, love, we have these words, we have scores for them. So we throw out all the other words, we take these guys, we count up how many times they appear. So baby appears three times, we have four for, for girl, and we have their average scores from these ratings. Very simple, very naive kind of thing to do. And the, so liar sitting here is two plus seven. Now, that's a very versatile word, and it might mean a liar as in a, as in a Lance Armstrong type lie, but it could mean lying down on the ground, right? So, so that's you know, lots of problems with meanings and so on. Um, and so if you average over these things, and we'll get a score for what Billy Jean here, 7.1. If we average over the whole album, we get 6.3. And if we do all of Michael Jackson's lyrics, we get 4. <coughs> we start to feel a little more confident about this, and we could at least on the side, we, it's an important thing where we can talk about the stability of this measure uh, because it's a big enough cloud of points, right? So, or, or words, if you like. So, if you're measuring the temperature of the room, it's okay to measure the temperature of the room. You wouldn't want to measure the temperature of a molecule. It doesn't really make sense. But there's some point at which we start to say, okay, we've got enough pieces in here. And we can look, as I said, the stability of the measure. Uh, we might want to look, uh, zoom out a little further. And again, as I said, this first measure we made is pretty crude. And it, it has some errors and so on. But there, we leave these out of this talk. We, we had these other measures of basically flatline, where we feed all these texts into them and nothing would come out and they took forever to run and so on. So this is the first thing where we really started to get something sensible out. Um, so this is music lyrics, and they're not weighted by popularity. Right? They're just sort a little bit, but they're, they're mostly it's from a, a, you know, a lyric site. Uh, they're weighted simply by uh, the uh, uh, diversity of them. So you can see this downward trend. Right? So some people this makes immediate sense, but um, <laughs> and he says it's a little choppy, but this is going back to 1960, 2010. And I'll make a comparison a little bit between before 1980 and after 1980, because they're sort of somewhat different things. Okay, so what's going on? So yeah, and, and this is a very naive thing, right? So we took uh, this is actually music song uh, titles. So titles are very strongly uh, you know, the emotional words are, are packed in there, there's not too much other stuff, so they're quite rich. So, let's see, so we have gospel at the top, and we have heavy metal at the bottom. So it sorts things out in a reasonable way. 
People usually want to know it. Then we have many more in here. Country and Western are things about here. Usually you get country and Western fame. I wasn't there. So, um, so the wonder is where it is. Pop is. So, and the other thing about this is, well, there are many things. But one is the stability of these genres, right? I mean, we're simply taking these titles. Uh, the titles are tagged according to the genre. And we have this tremendous stability across time. I mean, you could say it's going up and down. But we're, we're trying to measure a ridiculous thing. We're trying to measure the positivity of these these lyrics. So uh, heavy metal, of course, starts later on in this time frame, and uh, we've left out points where there's not enough data, but that's what's happened. So that's what this downward, this, this, this downward trend is really that it's not that pop has changed or rock has changed, but these other new musics have come along, and they also colonize a new emotional niche very strongly in some cases. So, of course, this music can make people happy. It's a complicated story. <laughs> Chris is a good guy. So this is a primitive example. This is our initial example of what we call these word shift graphs. So if you, you've seen wordles, I'm sure, um, what are the other words for those? Word clouds, right, where you have the size of the word is, is reflective of its importance or how it appears. So they're, um, they're, they're nice things. So this is a kind of a word cloud for grown-ups, for people who, uh, you know, you have to put a stick between your teeth to read them. But um, once you get them, they're great diagnostics. Okay, so... This is comparing nine, after 980 to before 1980, and why is so why is it lower? Okay, so we've seen this sort of introduction. So let's look at the individual words. So this is another. This is a very important check. You you don't see this in a lot of these analyses. So there's more, and this is a bit hard to read, but basically what's going on is more hate, pain, death, dead, sick, fear, hit, health, all these negative words. They're appearing more often. There's less love, baby, home, and music. Those things are. Uh, making the score go down because they're positive words that are appearing less frequently, right? So there are negative words that are appearing more frequently, positive ones that are appearing less frequently. And then there are these two, uh, then there are two other possibilities. There aren't as many, but you can imagine, you know, you're, you're looking at the, the flow of something and there are a couple of things going the other way. Okay, so we'll, we'll have some nice examples of that later on. There's a little less, uh, lonely has gone down. It just doesn't appear in, in, in lyrics as much. So that helps after 1980. It's a little less sad, loneliness and trouble. There's more life from God. So those, those things are going the other way. But overall, the trend is down, and you, you, you get this, this sense of the story from this. All right. Okay, we do this for fun. So this is the top, we have 20,000 artists at the top. This is the top 16, you know, based on having enough words. So this should be something for everyone in here. Uh, <laughs> Beach Boys and Buddy Holly. Uh, I didn't know what S Club 7 was, we had to look better. It's one of those, you know, bands that the English create out of nothing. Uh, they're all beautiful people and they can sing, maybe. Um, These are the happiest 16, not the most popular 16. No, right. These are recognizable. So the bottom 16, interesting list, right? So that's the bottom 16. I don't know if you recognize them. <laughs> Metallica is here, everyone should know Metallica. But um, yeah, and the words, the words. So of course we take. This is a, you know this is what we're doing. We're we're doing a very bad thing to text, right? We're just taking, we're just shredding them to pieces and putting them in piles on a table and saying, well, so many times you mentioned the word cat and so many times you mentioned the word frog and, and there's no context, right? Uh, so fine, we're going to get to that eventually. Hopefully, it's very hard. Uh, but it's true if you look at the words involved. <laughs> These guys by themselves, not so. Good. All right, so this is about as low as it gets, to so give you a sort of a, an idea of things. So if we're getting below 5, so 5 is a neutral score on our scale from 1 to 9. So getting below 5, really bad. That's an achievement. Uh, and these guys were up above 7. So, so that's what happened. We get 5 to 7, and I'll show you some more about why that is. Right, so the absolute highest you can give a word is 9, the lowest is 1. All right, so a couple other things. This came out of our earlier work, and I'm just going to highlight a few of them. So this is... We have uh, all this data from uh, blogs, from the, uh, a site called We, we Feel Fine, uh, which won all sorts of awards, maybe six or seven years ago. Uh, so, this, so people in some, on some blogs would report their age, and, or just declare it somehow. And these are sentences, so this is a special kind of sentence, they're sentences that have I feel or I am feeling somehow in them, right? So it's a, it's a sub-selection. So that was the idea behind that site, they're trying to find emotional sentences. <coughs> and then try to extract the word that people were talking about. So I feel sad, I feel happy, I feel quixotic, right? So they're pulling those words out and giving a way to view it beautifully done. So we use our uh, method to just go through all those, uh, those sentences. And so you see this climb and descent, right? So these are 13, 14 year olds. Somehow there were 
and maybe people masquerading and such. But there's a, this is a pretty good thing. We, you know, in terms of recovery, we're fairly uh, pleased with how it worked out. Um, and dropping off, so 45 to 60, things are, things are doing pretty well. Now, this is what people would say theoretically, you know, they walk into the door 40 years ago or something and say, in theory, you might expect something like this. Uh, if you ask people, it tends to go like this. So this is a bit of a, this is one thing that we find that, that seems to be against. And, and there's, there's a whole bunch of us. We have, we have a lot of things that seem commonsensical and reasonable and match up with what you might expect, match up with people who, what people have gotten from self-report. And then, so armed with that a little bit, say, hey, you know, it's not ridiculous. We can say, well, look, we found something quite different over here, so we should think about this. All right? So this is self, not self-report, of course. This is observing what people say. Um, so let's compare people in that 40 to 45 to 60 range to the 13, well, it's 14-year-olds here. So why are 14-year-olds more negative? Well, so here you can see this is one of these. It's a more complicated, uh, more um, elaborate word shift that we have now. So depressed, bored, lonely, alone, mad, pain, upset, fat. So this is middle school, right? So, <laughs> right? so all of these negative words are piling in. There are a couple of uh, positive words. They use happy, love, and loved, and fun, friend. They use those more. But the net story is this way. All right. um, okay, uh, I have one other comparison. Oh, yeah, so uh, men and women. So we find something that seems to agree with self-report that, that on average, not, not so different. So you see the scores up here, they're very similar. But you can still compare them, right? You can still look at the difference in the words. And so this is women compared, or female compared to male. Uh, so what you see is, okay, all of this adds up to no difference, but women use the word love more, uh, hurt, hate, sad, alone, baby, loved, happy, stupid, guilty, sick. So they use these words all more. The only word in this top 15 that men use more is good, which is their emotional catch-all. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> So, got to be careful when a person is good. Uh, so, so, larger standard deviation for women. That's what we can, and this is from blogs, it's from, from people declaring that male or female on a blog in a sentence with I So, you know, that's a, that's a special thing. All right, so we, uh, we, we, we went beyond this, we're going to go beyond this as a, as even further, as I'll say it towards the end. Uh, but what, this is what we call Lab MT 1.0, and we'll get to 2.0. But this is a language assessment by Mechanical Turk. Which is essentially people in the U.S. and India. It's just the way it works. It's a, the the majority of people who are uh, on this service. So if you don't know about it, it's created by Amazon. It was created by Amazon a few years ago, really for them to tag things in a good way. Right? So it's a crowdsourcing site. Uh, you pay what is a relatively small amount to get people to uh, to do jobs that computers can't do. Right? To do jobs very well that computers. So if you have ten thousand images that you need to be tagged or identified right in some way, then you can send it off to this service, and people at home will click on it, right, and, and say, oh, you know, it's a picture of a cat, or whatever, and a computer would say it's a triangle. So, so, so much, we're much better at many of these artificial, so-called artificial intelligence uh, grand challenges than, than uh, computer science has managed to produce so far. I mean, maybe that'll change eventually. The tagline for this thing is artificial, artificial intelligence. That's, <laughs> uh, and Mechanical Turk famously was a, uh, a, um, a scam uh, in the 17 or 1800s in Europe. It was a sort of an automaton robot thing that was taken around, put on a stage, and you, someone would play chess with it, um, going from town to town. And the robot would win, but of course it had a person inside it. Right? So, <laughs> so it feels like you're sending, and it very much feels like you're sending a job off to some supercomputer, but it's all about people. All right, so this is what I think is part of a very, you know, we're doing all the time socio-technical computing. There are very interesting problems that we can solve. Google's a great example, actually, because people and computers, really. All right, so we sent off uh, a list, well, I should say this, we sent off a list of 10,000 words. And we did something very different. We took them from very, four different corpora. We didn't make these words up ourselves. Uh, so it's Twitter, Google Books for hundreds of years, Twitter for several years, which is an enormous moment. Music lyrics, again, for 50 years, and New York Times for 20 years. We just took everything. And then we ordered those words by frequency of usage. So V is a number one for all of these, and then R and so on. So we put in the, these boring, obviously neutral words. Just put them in. But you get out to 150 words, and that's half. That's typically half of the words that are, that are actually used in any text uh, in terms of frequency of usage. So pretty quickly, you can get out to interesting words. And if you merge those, we did 5,000 for each set. If you merge them together, you get 10, over 10,000 words. So we send them off, 50 evaluations each. 
This is what, this is just to show you the sort of, sort of a sanity thing. This is the average score here. Again, nine is the maximum, so laughed at. All these things did very well. They, the rainbow is in there. Well, you can just stare at this if you're not feeling so good. Um, and then, of course, we have the flip side. So there's low standard deviation for these two. They're pretty, they're pretty solid. Uh, and so the bad things are down the bottom, right? So we have cancer and terrorists and suicide and all these bad things. Bad things in the bottom. Uh, and then we have, you know, interesting gradations in between. So they come out to be uh, neutral. All right, so we can also look at things that have high standard deviation, but people aren't really sure about it or they have varying opinions. Uh, and so you see swearing, alcohol, cigarettes, uh, uh, religion is in here, ways to run uh, large groups of people, capitalism, socialism, I think is in there somewhere. Uh, zombies, zombies make it in, some people like zombies, some people don't. Um, so this is a bit of a funny group, and I'll show you what we kind of, we, how we deal with them. But yeah, that's pretty good. Alright. And you can see, so their, their averages of, many of them have averages close to five, right? They have these big spreads, so people are not sure. And there are, there are some pretty big differences for, you know, based on the gender of the person evaluating them and all sorts of things that we can get into. But. All right, so I want to show you this, uh, this finding about language, which I think is quite significant and allows us to make this instrument that that's, has some, some interesting capacity to it. Uh, so, again, one is the lowest you could have, nine is the highest. If you have ever gave it a one, that's what you would be. This is a histogram of these 10,000 words. So neutral is in the middle here, five. So you can see this positive bias sitting there, right? And maybe, I don't know, maybe I should have asked you beforehand, but people have some people think, so if you're a psychologist, you think it's negative. Um, a negative bias, or it could have been neutral. I mean, how do we, right? but we're social organisms, right? So this is kind of a nice reflection of that. I think it's a profound reflection. Has this been done for other languages to see if we're like more, more positive? So English, you're saying? English, right. 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 English. But like they have compared it with like Russian or? So we do, all right, so it's coming. We, it's, it's, this is expensive to do, so right. it's took you know, three, four thousand dollars, I think. Uh, we are at the brink of doing 10 more languages. And Russian should be in that. Yeah, and Russian is the one we always ask about. Uh, <laughs> yesterday, there was a guy from the yeah. European Union who wanted to know all about uh, Greece, actually. So, uh, <laughs> but Russian. Uh, so we have one article written in Le Monde, I think, uh, and got a lot of comments associated with it. But it's basically because the framing was English is a, is an optimistic language, and then and there are all these comments about yeah, yeah not us, you know, we're we're Vergolic. <laughs> shrugs built into our language, and uh, so, so we'll see, we'll see. The French could be more closed in. I will say that there was a study that was done, uh, what was called ANU, there was a Spanish version of that. I just took the, the thousand words, translated them straight up, and uh, tested them in Madrid, and the correlation is pretty strong, actually. So that, that turned out to be pretty similar. I think the French might be a more emotionally close, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how that works out. Um, I will say that uh, our evaluations, we did the ANU words as well, and again, very good correlations. So that was interesting, because it's a very different group of people. All right, so that gives you some confidence. I mean, it's a rough thing we're doing, but it didn't change or turn things upside down. Um, okay. I, another thing to say here is the self-report ones are always, how are, you, how are you feeling? Not happy, happy, very happy. It's usually sort of three things, three big buckets that you can put yourself into. And then that's turned into a number. 0, 1, 2 or something. So that's, that's a somewhat fraught uh, transition there in terms of quantifying things. You know, here we've tried to put some numbers in from the start. And we acknowledge all sorts of problems. All right, so let's, there's something extra in here, right? So this, this is, this is uh, on the right-hand side, it's, it's positively biased. This is looking at the individual uh, text, and I'll, we can look at this a couple of different ways. <coughs> so the yellow shows you above neutral. So that's true in all of these um, individual data sets. Music lyrics has the mode at 5, at least by the spinning. Uh, but these, these the shapes here show you what the first thousand words, the next thousand words, and the next thousand in terms of frequency of usage, how they work. So you can see they actually have very similar patterns as well. So there's this scale and variance in the emotional content of, of the English language. And we'll be very interested to see how that works in, um, in others. And I have two more slides to kind of point that out. So, uh, so, this is the, so there's a little gray point for every word in here, and there are 5,000 words. This is for the New York Times. This is its distribution sitting on top. And so war is here, funeral is here. So these are common words that are negative. Uh, there's one and love and loving. These are common words that are positive. Uh, succeeded is down here. It's 
I mean, succeed is a, a common word, but succeed is not pleasure. These are relatively uncommon, but positive ones. Wars is here, rape, sick, negative ones. So the point is that this distribution, if you look across here or across here or across here, very similar all the way down. So it's not that rare words are the negative ones. <coughs> and this could have been anything. I really, I mean, this really could have been anything. Um, <coughs> So there's some very interesting questions about the emotional, the informational content of this as well. Right? So we don't use native words relatively as much. When we do, they really mean something. But we haven't kind of sorted that out yet. You guys do advertising in this, or you pull that out? Is it just an editorial? This one, so it's New York Times. What we do know is there's no advertising. No advertising. Yeah, so that would obviously yeah. change things. So. Yeah. Okay. So and and so the New York Times is a much more complicated. So Jake has been working on that. So you, you there are, it's. It's done in a reasonable way, but again, it's 20 years hand coded. Mm -hmm. Some of it you have market, this is the market stuff, mm -hmm. this is sports, this is health. That's you know, done in various ways. We have a, Jake has an initial finding that the market stuff goes down through the week. <laughs> <laughs> Which I asked my wife as a financial journalist, and I asked her without what she thought it would be. She's like, oh, yeah, There's one pain section in that text, and that is the pain oh. death notices, oh, yeah. which are much more positive than the obituaries. And that makes sense. Huh. Is your Twitter is that from all English-speaking countries or just an American subset? What our Twitter data set? So we get about ten percent of all tweets, and we just huh. shovel them into a huge box, which is some of which is in Chris's office. But it's a, which makes it very hot. Um, we get about ten percent of all tweets. So Twitter's changed over time. It's a very interesting, complicated, difficult data set to deal with. Um, we've been lucky to get that much. We we wrote to them when there were only four of them working there, and it was just taking off. And we said this looks interesting. And they're like, sure. So we have a pipeline to them. Um, and they've added a lot to that data set. So now you can see if, a lang if what, what language is being used. But, it, but that's not really great. Like they'll try to say, this is a Spanish tweet. Or well, the person who's tweeting has a self-identified as a Spanish speaker. The term, so, so there are all sorts of possibilities. There, we have geolocation for about 1% of those tweets. So that's, and I'll show you a little bit of that later on. But that helps as well, so you know where people are. Are you going to look at how people move around? All sorts of things. Okay. Is that? Well, I was wondering, like, there's an American or a UK or an Australian bias, because it's all English speaking, but it might have different. Yeah, so you need to get the evaluations. So that's a huge, it's a huge undertaking. We, as I said, we'll get different languages. You, you could get evaluations done by men and women in different places and so on, and, and different ages. We'll see. And, and, and so far, we've seen, to some extent, that English and Spanish, for example, aren't too variable. So maybe we see more of that. Or maybe we start to find Russian is you know, just way off the back. <laughs> Which is a reasonable hypothesis. This is another way of viewing it. These are deciles. So you take a sliding window of 500 words, create the distribution for it, and then uh, compute the deciles. And this is just plotting them as they go down. I call these jellyfish plots. Um, and you can see that they're pretty set. So again, rare words have a similar distribution to Somewhat rare words, to somewhat common words, very common words. So that that that's so that's a funny feature of language. Just saying it. Right. So here's some. Here, this builds into this ridiculously complicated plot. And you can ignore this piece, and I want to tell you about these three things here. So this is the time series we get out of Twitter, and this is just using everything, right? So we 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 have some plots, of course, where we have everything from Twitter. Uh, then you want to start to say, all right, well, what about this particular region? What? A, okay, you can focus in from that, but. From a rough outside piece, we, we, we're getting a voice in Twitter. So there are all these time series here, and this is going from uh, back in 2008 through to 2011, uh, so it's you know, several years. And I'll show you what these are later, but this is really Christmas, Christmas, there are spikes here. Okay, so <clears throat> what's happening is, what we're doing, we're taking our list of words, here's the distribution, and we're saying, okay, well, the neutral ones, we don't really need to count the, we don't, right, so we're going to throw that out. But we want to do that in a principal way. And so people will, so in, in linguistics, this is, these are called stop words, or in computer science, you find your stop words and you say, I don't want any uh, pronouns or prepositions, we'll just throw them out. Okay, well, so there, there are sort of somewhat principal ways to do it. This, this seems to be a very explicitly principal way to do it. So we take the uh, neutral point and we simply open up a little window and we throw all those guys away and we just use these much more obviously um, emotionally laden words. And so as we tune this out, this distribution rises up because we're throwing away a lot of this neutrality in here and the positive side up here is starting to, to really 
um, <clears throat> pull the average score up. So the average score will move around. But the, if you correlate these distributions with each other, which is this plot, and this is as a function of the window size here and here, symmetric. If you correlate these time series, then you see there's this internal uh, section here between a width of 0.5 out to 2.5, where they're very similar. Right? So you're getting the same. So imagine this is like turning the contra contrast up on a picture. So you see the same picture all the way from um, what, it, what you start with to a very one that has really sharp edges in it. It's really well defined. Then it goes to static. So this is a uh, you know it's, it's it's a very interesting feature. We can we can dial up and down. We can get this kind of sharpness. If, if we're out in this point, we're getting a really sharp kind of. These are highly resolved. We're seeing big changes as we go along. It's much flatter along here, but we're using many more words to get that score. So it becomes less robust out here, but able to get these sharp edges. All right, so this is sort of, you know, it's like tuning a microscope in and out. It's a, it's, it's a funny thing. All right, this is to show you how that could work. This is pretty crazy. This is between uh, midday and 1 p.m. for all of 2010 uh, on Twitter, local time. No, I guess actually it's real, it's East Coast time. Who knows? <laughs> no, it's East Coast time. So we put all those in a box and, um, we do Which one is this one? Do you know? Yeah, it's one of them. So there's local time and then there's, clock, there's some big clock time. All right. um, okay, so this is just all the words and they're scaled by the size of how much they count for this, this, uh, this measure, right? So we add up the sizes of all of these guys, if you like, and we get our average score. And it's been changed a little bit, so zero is now neutral and it's moving out this way. So these are the happiness of the words, happiness, the average happiness, and this is the frequency of them. So no is a negative word and appears a lot gives it a big contribution, right? Love is in here, you is a positive word, a big contribution. So V is a very, very common word, but very neutral, so you can still see it. And then you get down into these tiny, these tiny words that are very infrequent. They have strong scores, so they blow up a little bit. So kill is in here, and death and so on. Uh, happy is sitting out there. So what we do is we take out this middle, right? So that's what we're doing. Uh, we, we'll remove these guys and we're getting rid of this neutral stuff and you can see how the, these contributions are changing. This is just sort of for fun. I don't know. Uh, and we can really get out to about 2.5. So you see square words and negativity out here and you see this bunching of positivity. So that's gonna, that'll, that'll make us cool. All right, fine. So that's our instrument. Where we are now, we're going to improve it in other ways, different languages, we're moving to phrases. But let's use it. So Twitter, as I said, we, we, we have this thing for Twitter, but it's not everything. Uh, this is uh, mentions of, this is just, just to talk about how straightforward Twitter is in terms of telling you what people are doing right now. This is mentions of the word bre breakfast, lunch, and dinner across 24 hours, average over a large period of time. You know, people love to talk about food, right? So, which, which I have to say is another very interesting angle into this whole the Twitter data set. And we're getting at that. We have data now on restaurants and all sorts of things. Okay, so, yes, you know what they're doing right now. Uh, this is hungry, starving, food, eat, and unfortunately for these guys, chicken. So they follow very similar curves. Pizza is different. First is different. Um, I think salad is quite different as well. But, uh, but so you see this sort of thing, and that, that's, a, that's a really nice enterprise that's, that's waiting to be done, where you find all of the very similar structures and, and, and see how they match up. Okay, so this is just about living in, in, living in the now. There are very odd things on Twitter. This is just a goofy little thing. Ha ha ha, though, I have to say, is an important term. People use this a lot. Ha ha and ha ha ha, and they have good salience. They matter. You never see the New York Times, unless they're quoting something. So these are you know, funny words that appear on Twitter that, that matter to what, we, what we're doing. You know, no with repeated O's. Right? So, so that has some valence. So this is just looking at repeats. So this is 100, 140 characters of ha 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 which is quite hard to type, <laughs> if you're quite concerned. Uh, so there are a lot of errors as well. Anyway, lots of funny patterns just floating around. Okay, so let's get to the serious thing. So this is taking everything from Twitter, and again, you know, you improve. This is just one uh, source text. We'll put in other things if you like. You can put in every tweet from Vermont, whatever you want. And I'll blow this up a little bit, but this is basically a time series, and, and um, there are little uh, symbols here to show you what everything is. But the overall story is that you see these spikes of positivity, and they're all predictable things. It's Christmas, Valentine's Day, right? People are simply just talking about those things. Happy Thanksgiving. You get people, people want to chime in usually and say, well, Thanksgiving is a terrible day. You know, everyone's miserable. 
but that's their family. Um, <laughs> that's always true, but sorry. I'm sorry if that's true, but you know, Chris, you know, I'll talk about Christmas being a fraud thing. So what we do, of course, we do our little wordship thing, and you do see Christmas has some negative words. So a lot of people say Merry Christmas, but there's some, there's some sad stuff as well. You see that on Valentine's Day. You know, you see lonely and so on. Saturday is a very positive day, but you also see bored and hangover and drunk, right? So there's some of that stuff, but overall, it's a more positive day than Tuesday. We'll get to that. So those bad things you might think about are in there. This is to show you a blow up of part of it. This is for 2011. Lots of things happened. Um, so all of these positive days are things that were well, uh, the, the spike ones, these, these shocks, if you like, were well anticipated, right? So there's Mother's Day and Father's Day, Easter is here. The Royal Wedding is the only one in all of our time series that pops up that wasn't a, that isn't a, an annual event, but of course it was hugely anticipated. Talks about you know, wedding dress, beautiful, all those words appear. Uh, and then we have all these negative things, which we simply did not find with our previous instrument. It just could not pick these things up. It didn't have negative words in it that, that picked this up. This is the tsunami off of Japan. This is the death of Osama bin Laden, which is a very kind of fraught, complicated, emotional day. People usually say, well, it should not be positive. Well, yes, if you look at the, the word shift, you'll see celebrated, celebrating in USA some positive things. But it's a very negative thing, having a very negative character. So that you know, in our simple mind of measure, comes up with a bunch of negative words, right? Death and killed and so on. So, um, Amy Winehouse's death, that's the attack in Norway, uh, London riots. This is the ridiculous earthquake on the East Coast, which, <laughs> which, whose only effect was to get a lot of media. But it did actually have substantial impact, but it was only being talked about. Right? Some lawn chairs fell over, that was it. Uh, the 9 11 memorial uh, is, is there as well. Okay, so. You see some things pop out. We're trying to make that somewhat more automatic. Uh, okay, this is a, I've, I've mentioned these things, these are these word shifts uh, for these things. But usually you see wedding and kiss and prince and princess. And now, a nice little piece in there though is that there's less no and there's less, there's less swearing, there's less kill, there's less not. It's being compared to the two weeks around it. Um, but there's less of those little like don't and so on, right? So you see some, some nice aspects there which just sort of add to the, the story. All right. That's fine. Lots of detail. So we do have this thing. I could, I could, I guess, play around with it. But basically, this is coming online soon. It's hedonometer.org. I think you have to put W's in front of it. You know, we're getting these things sorted out. Uh, it's, it's a, uh, it's to start with, just going to be Twitter. Uh, little, little rollover things here that show you these little uh, word shifts to give you a sense of it, um, and you can click on ranges and so on. So we're trying to build this thing so people can see it. It's a real thing. It's like you know, not like it. It's something you can go up on a dashboard eventually. So this is a this is a big start to work with uh, Mida um, and our colleague Brian Tubman. Um, so it's very soon, very soon, which means a year from now. But it's getting close. <laughs> it's getting close. People are suffering mightily to uh, to uh, make this thing work and shine. Um, but yeah, so it has some very nice uh, kind of functionality. But this is just a start. Again, you'll be able to flip between different languages. You'll be able to flip to say BBC and different different kind of input series, and then eventually correlate with other things and all sorts of stuff. And we'll have an API so people can get the data. All right. Now, so you've got the idea of this. I'll just give you a few uh, pieces here about um, you know some other aspects we found. This is the weekly cycle which I mentioned. Uh, so Saturday's positive. Tuesday's actually really the low day. We see that repeatedly. That seems to be quite strong. Uh, if you ask people. This is just looking at our data set and seeing what people said about the individual days and those ratings. Then this is how they rate. This is actually pretty good. So Monday's the lowest, right? People don't like Monday. So this is the average score for the individual word Monday, right? Looking at the word Monday. But from that, it actually goes up. So it tracks what we have for uh, what people actually talk about on those days. Except it's really Tuesday that's the lowest. Bad things can happen. Lots of other things you can do. So this is a case where we took uh, 100 uh, terms, so including things like Stephen Colbert and smiley faces and exclamation marks and Lehman Brothers, and we just found every tweet that had those terms in them, um, and put them in a big, just just pulled out every tweet that has Stephen Colbert in it, and look at the ambient words, right? So we take those words out and look at the ambient words. So happy has a nice batch of words around it. Christmas makes sense. Vegan actually has good words around it. Evaluated by itself, not so good. Um, 
the smiley faces, turn, the, the, the words that are around smiley faces, it gives you a nice ordering, right? So it's, a, it's the plain smiley, it's one with a nose, there's the more complicated with the semicolon, semicolon with the nose, and then the sad, sad ones are down here. So things spread out, so you know, we had, there's Colbert and John Stewart and Glenn Beck, uh, there's, you know, we had some themes, there's Summer in there and so on, so Republican and Democrat, we, we, we got a bunch of little things that people might put together. So the Lehman Brothers is hanging in there. All right, yeah, interesting. All right, but so down the bottom, Iraq, flu, uh, unfortunately, mosque, Afghanistan, headache, drugs, all negative things. BP, BP got into a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you follow these tweets back to the person or to the yeah. to the code? So can can you compute like this sort of metrics for individual users? Yes, you can. Right. So and uh, so. So others have done that work too, but we, yeah, you can track people as long as they tweet enough, then you could have a story for them. So one of the things we've done, and I don't even have any these slides, is uh, it's Kathy Bliss, um, I'm trying to get through too much, uh, has uh, created a network of people based on whether they reply to each other on, on Twitter, right? So not just, right, so I might follow Oprah, let's say, but that, that, that's not a connection, right? So if you have directed tweets or replies to each other, we'll count that as some kind of a connection, and then we do it over different time scales, right? So with that, you see correlations, and then you look at the, the um, expressions of people over long, that period of time, and you can see that emotionally people are correlated. It actually goes out three or four steps into the network, so that's, which is a long way in a social network. Four steps is huge. I wonder how you account for, so people say Merry Christmas, yeah, but it doesn't mean they're merry, yeah, and you know, Happy Holidays, so we, I mean, I do that all the time around the holidays and Happy New Year, I don't know that I'm happy with that, yeah, right. and how does that, how does that put? Well, it's, it's the words around it as well, I mean, so you see, you see, yes, you, they're dominant, but you see these, so you see family and friends, you do see hmm. enough other words around in these word, these kind of word five things we make, to make you feel like it's not just uh, in power. Mm. I mean, it is partly, right? But, but people are saying it. They're saying Happy Thanksgiving. Right. Uh, and it's not bad to look at those tweets. Mm -hmm. right? You find the one that say Happy Thanksgiving. There'll be some people in there saying, you know, I hate everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> amazing what people will say on Twitter publicly. It's just unbelievable. I mean, of course, we never look at the tweets, right? You know. um, hmm. Do you account for, is this just the total volume of tweets that, so like, I'm thinking about the Lehman Brothers. Yeah. Because, you know, the big thing with Lehman Brothers was a while ago. So, yeah, so this, this is, was such a volume back then? This is for 2000 and, yeah, so, so this is 2000 and maybe 11 or 10. Okay. This is one year, and uh, we have in here the total number of tweets mm -hmm. about them and so on. So, yeah, you could look at them and they'll, they'll evaporate. Right. They have evaporated. Mm -hmm. I have some friends who work, work for them. Um, <clears throat> all gone. So, uh, yeah, so we have time series as well, so you can see, so we have one for, say, Tiger Woods, for example, which is going along and then takes a big dive, <laughs> and that actually rebounds, interesting. Nike's uh, ability to sponsor athletes to do bad things is really remarkable. My wife is writing a story about it this morning, because <laughs> I told her she should, and that's a terrible story. But anyway, uh, this is, uh, again, Lewis Mitchell, uh, various other characters involved, Morgan, Frank, and Cameron, Harris, before him. Uh, we've been trying to get a geography, so you have where people have tweeted. Again, it's a smaller subset. Hawaii is quite happy, so so red is happy. So we have happiness out here, relatively speaking. Vermont is is, is doing it right. Uh, so Louisiana and Mississippi, not so good. So there's a paper in Science a few years ago trying to connect the positivity of uh, or the the self-reported happiness of people in states to infrastructure, for example, to show that there was a connection. And it, it was mostly good, except they had Louisiana at number one, which good. I see one that shows that, Demo that Republicans are happier than Democrats. This clearly shows the opposite. Oh no, Maryland is really. It's a little, yeah. It's not quite as, uh, right, so there's, yeah. But, yeah. That's like the DC. Uh, actually, yeah, yeah. So Utah, Utah, Utah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy. Although that could be because, so, you know, we put everything in there. There are bots and all sorts of things. So that could be because there's some dubious services coming out of Utah for that money. I don't know. Um, no question about it. Accuracy or error bars. Mm -hmm. I've only seen one slide that had error bars, and yeah. in, that, in that one, those error bars erased the, this, the differences that were listed. So, so there are home signal. Have I shown error bars? I don't think so. Actually, I mentioned this at the start that that's a separate thing which we could talk about. But um, uh, you had standard deviation on one of your graphs. Oh, well, that's Not okay. Graph, sorry, table. So that's a different thing altogether. Actually, so you could use standard deviation. We did think about that, but. 
one way to do it is to um, use subsamples of words in the evaluation and then go sort of a bootstrapping technique. And there's a slide I've taken out where I show that for uh, the, the um, music lyrics, for example. So you, see, you can see that it's robust over time. So, or over different sets of words. The average score changes quite a bit because if you take the word love out of music lyrics, for example, that's going to be a big change. So it's really the trends that's, that are robust. So we have a way, and I, that's, that's a paper that we'll, we'll have to, we have a student working on that now. We need a, uh, we have ways that we think are reasonable so far, but we need a definitive one. Yeah. So I wonder if there's a piece here about not measuring happiness, but of insecurity or challenge. Somebody who's in an insecure environment and feels hopeless and out of control might tend to use more negative words, where people who are in secure, stable environments might tend to utilize more positive words. So you, you get the dichotomy of Utah and Washington State both being red. Because, you know, despite the political differences, they're secure, relatively secure, in a stable, predictable environments. Yeah, I mean, I we we have a lot of work to do to you know connect these things to everything. I mean, we've we've started, I have a few slides here to show you some more things here, but um, quite possible. I think if we had evaluations of some of these other emotional dimensions, again, it's a big undertaking to get those scores. We could we could tease some of that out. I mean, we have the the power type one, which is do you feel in control or not in control? That's another spectrum, um, and the excitement level. One. I think it's important because when you're, you're utilizing Twitter, which is a real-time environment, people, why, what are, why are, how are people choosing the words? They are about what? I mean, they're, they're reporting something that's happening very instantaneously. Yeah, which, you know, which we think is, is, is not a bad thing, but it's not, it's, it's, it's one slice of the whole piece, right? But it's, it's amazing to have that input, right? So that's the breakfast, lunch, and dinner slide. So, this is kind of what's going on. It's not what they think about it a week later. However, you know, we can start to get at, if you have individuals you, that you're tracing through time, you can see, you know, did they travel? Or have they been tweeting a long way away? Were they in a national park? Were they somewhere? You can look at that sort of stuff and see how their mood is changing over time. Or is it because of their social networks changing? And of course, you know, you can't, can't measure everything about people, but. But is there enough data that we're getting out to kind of say that there's a reasonable correlation between changes in their social network or changes in where they live or, right? There's not a lot of demographic data straight up with Twitter, but given where people tweet from, then you have something there. So you can start to connect that. To so, uh, totally out of time. Yeah, yeah, we're just like interrupting you to ask questions now, I guess. Oh, that's right. So, um, <clears throat> I've always wondered about external validation, right? Mm -hmm. So there are surveys. Do you feel hopeful about the coming year? There's standardized things. Pew does them all the time. By state, right. by city, by county, by census tract. Pew ones would be good. Would so be that's good. a measure of long-term happiness, not just was the burrito good that you just had for lunch, which is one of the criticisms yeah. you had, right? It's a very ephemeral mood measure. That Twitter wasn't is. actually it, but that's good. So okay, anyway. Would it? So, but there are long-term ones, too. On... On average, yeah. are you happy right now with your life and your life situation? So very different questions, right? Ha yeah. Right. So have People you correlated them? Right. Have you correlated them? Does does the Twitter stuff we we by state? That. that would be good. It's I, like I didn't know if you had that. Because yeah. yeah. I mean, a bunch of people in this room measure happiness and know a lot about these yeah. uh, revealed response sure. these yeah. survey based data. It'd be a really easy thing to just check whether it's indicative of long term happiness. Right. Oh, we're trying to design. Oh. Sorry. Oh no, it's about to go first. Already. Yeah, so we're trying to design an experiment mm -hmm. uh, to determine happiness, and I use what I understand of your method. Mm -hmm. I would be freaked that I had all kinds of uncontrolled um, <laughs> issues. So uh, let me ask a couple of questions. First of all, just based on your method and your numbers, mm -hmm. are Napa, California, and Longmont, Colorado, really different from that graph? So I'm back to the uh, error box question. Oh right. So no, we so we have a way we could get in there and we could we could test. I mean, there's just so many dimensions here, right? We have 400 cities, and this is just a, a rough cut of this one. We have a, we could produce another, you know, 400 choose two, uh, kind of interactive thing, 
which we may have, I don't know if Lewis has that in, in all of the appendices, but, but basically gets at whether these guys are stable above each other. Yeah. Okay, uh, here's just an anecdote I was thinking of, uh, this question of how these uh, variables so, stay constant as you... Yeah, it, this is the bottom. Right. You know, whether word X is really happy or not happy. Mm -hmm. uh, the main drag in Knoxville, Tennessee is called Gay Street, or it used to be. When Knoxville was a smaller city, it was Gay Street, G-A-Y. It's still Gay Street, but it's not the main drag anymore. And it has a totally different connotation than it did once. And it seems to me sure. some of the terms here could have similar problems. Um, no, that's absolutely true. I mean, so SIG, for example, is, is a good modern term. It has very different meanings depending on how people use it. So again, um, very aware of that. I mean, we're using many, many words to get some kind of a cloud of a score. And you can look... So these word shift things will show you if, you, if, it's, if it's a disaster or not, right? if you're getting anywhere. Generally speaking, you see a whole set of words. Yeah, maybe something like sick is there or some, something that's much more ambiguous. And we do throw out the very ambiguous ones, right? So the, those swearing ones and so on, the ones that, are, that are, um, have a high standard deviation but fall in the middle of the spectrum, they get discarded from our, our scoring mechanism. So the ones that people are much more uncertain about. Um, so, uh, so it's about that, you know, there are many molecules here, some of them are going the other way, some of them are very hard to tell what kind of molecule it is, uh, and it's about averaging over many to get something that's, that's reasonably sensible. But, you know, one of the problems we have, I think, you now that you get to the sort of big data world, is that what you really want, you can produce a million graphs, but what you need is to have sort of an interactive thing, and we're, we're starting to get that with, with that online piece, because what, it, what you know, you just asked this question, it would be great to just go poke like this and, and reveal it. But that's, it's an enormous amount of data to get that. So there's a, there's a big bag of words behind this one, a big bag of words behind this one. And, we, and then, of course, each one. So we have all those pairwise comparisons. Um, uh, but you can, you, can, you can show that up to some, so far as we've done it, that uh, yes, you know, Beaumont, Texas is definitely lower than Napa, and then at some point you might be confident that something that's 6.05 and so on is, 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 you know, is low. And you can start to see why that is, you know, which words. Is it? I mean, is it just because they're using the word wine in that yeah. that's, that's mm -hmm. Going back to those happiest ones, I mean, correlating to these, I mean, a lot of those are fairly wealthy towns, mm -hmm. but like Porterville is definitely, I mean, that'd be like the Bhutan of that chart up there. Yes, yeah, so we have like 400 um, demographics, uh, demographic piece of information over that, 450 or something, for each city. Oh, it's about five. So yeah, you can start to look at that. And you, so there's a huge socio economic uh, um, You see at one end uh, where you know, so education rates are very low. You see the words are much smaller, uh, and the tweets are smaller. You see much more about family, um, and kind of friends, it's local. On the other end, you have things like film, and you know, professor, and like exotic foods and so on. It's a, it, it really is this texture that you see as you move across all these, these cities. But it's, it's deeply correlated. Yeah. How much effect... Aside like, from happiness. That's aside from happiness. Yeah. It's just like a word usage. It's just words. Yeah. Like in a small city like Porterville, how much effect could one out-of-control tweeter have? <laughs> yeah, so we threshold it so we try to you know, get rid of those things. And, and so the right thing to do would be to make sure that there's enough variety in these things. Yeah. So we've seen that, you see that problem. Of course there are bots, you know, so you have to be careful with that. So, I mean, Twitter and, and the internet is biased anyway towards educated people and toward, you know, people with more money, so... Uh, it's true, it's amazing who's on Twitter, that? though. Twitter has really changed. There's a lot of... Um, and, and, and I you're right, it's true. Right. I mean, the Pew, Pew has this data. Yeah, there's right? plenty of evidence of that. Yeah, Pew yeah. keeps sampling this, and mm -hmm. you see the changes, and of course, initially, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But it's spread out quite a bit. It and it's, yeah, it's really used quite um, strongly in um, some pretty unprivileged areas. I mean, because you just need a phone, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. that's sure that's something, but a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. um, so you see some amazingly rough and ready statements made on Twitter. I mean, just incredible. incredible. But there's, there is this, yeah. So this is not talking about happens, it's just looking at the word usage from across cities. Uh, and there, of course, you have. 100,000 words, you have five, You have a lot of stuff to sort of sift through. So here's a little, here's, here's a little one, this is a, 
this is just saying, well, what about McDonald's, right? And this is now we have obesity level. Uh, and so it goes up. It's not, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty scattered, but it's the p value is 10 to the minus 5, 0.3. So, you, so then you can ask, well, right, what about other words? Um, this is looking at brunch. So brunch goes down. So brunch is for people who don't really eat food. <laughs> That's the obesity rate of the town or the location? What? The location rate, yeah. 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 Uh, and so the, the obesity data is separated from our other census data. Where we have the US census data, which has maybe 500 demographic pieces. The obesity one is a different shape file. So that's a, we can't quite stick them together. But then you can say, all right, well, all right, we have obesity rate. So let's just line set these regions up by obesity rate and then look at which terms correlate with it. Just which, this is not happiness, this is just word usage. Right? Um, and yes, there are all these problems with it. But uh, so cafe, sushi, brewery, these are ones that are anti correlated Fondue, Apple could be computers. But banana, right? Tofu's in there, hashtag vegan. I mean, it's, so these are words that are food type words, right? So these are people who, yeah, that socioeconomic piece is really clear here as well, right? So at the other end, you have, it's, it's not just McDonald's, right? You also have eat and hungry and hungry like and ham. So there are, there are not as many that are strongly correlated at that, but these are ones that are correlated. I don't know. So they, this is fishing around looking at some things. And now, over, over years, you have changes in obesity rates, and we can look at changes in expressions, and changes in demographics, and, and we'll, we'll see what sort of path we get with that. This is the last piece I wanted to show you, actually, which is just moving towards uh, phrases. And this is Jake. It's brilliant. Uh, brilliant uh, it's too good to be true, but it's a brilliant, a brilliant piece of work where so you're trying to go through, let's so say you want New York City to come out as New York City. You don't want to break it into New York and New York and City. That's, so that's of course what we're doing right now. Uh, so this is, this is a, an initial attempt to do this. This is for music lyrics. So you see uh, phrases of, that, that seem quite strong. So I know you, you know I, and I know. So these are pieces that are popping out as consistent, coherent, in this case, trigrams. Uh, and then the idea is to try to build up this corpus uh, in this way. And, and get evaluations for those, right? So we have, we're looking at the molecules and more. What we have atoms. Now we're looking at molecules. Trying to. So that's a that's a that's a complicated thing. Uh, engrams have been around for a long time. You, you might not know Google engrams, where you would take a text and just get out all of its five grams, for example. But this is a more difficult thing where you're trying to uh, break the text up and you say, okay, this word is a word by itself. We'll, we'll just keep that as a word by itself. But the next three. They kind of clump. We'll make them a clump. For the next five, that's sort of a thing I see over and over again, so I'll keep that. On that note, <laughs> I want to cut things off. Um, it's it's uh, thank you, Peter.